Welcome, guys, back to the Grateful Living Podcast. Today, I'm thankful to have Michaela, Mar- Marguerite, and Morgan with me today. Michaela is a breast cancer survivor. Marguerite is an ovarian cancer survivor. And with the help of their sister, Morgan, they have formed a nonprofit called We Fight Like Girls, where they ma- raise money through fundraisers. Uh, in October of 2020, they had a virtual run. Uh, through their efforts, they have been able to raise over sixty thousand dollars for their cause. Uh, their causes, uh, they donate the money to the Foundations for Women's Cancer and the Memorial Sloan Kettering Breast Cancer Research. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks thank for having us. Thanks for having us. Of course, thankful to have you on. Uh, so, you know, just for the audience, uh, if you could. Just give us, you know, brief introductions on your life, I guess, pre-2018 uh, and, you know, where, where you guys were in each of your lives at, up at that point. I can go first because I feel like this kind of starts with me. Um, so 2018, I would say it was around August of 2018 when I was um, first diagnosed with ovarian cancer. At that time, I was um, working in the city and living at home with my parents, so that's always fun. Um, But I guess at that time, I was starting to feel like just not sick, thought thought that I had like too much pizza to eat one night, um, which is what caused me to um, go to the doctor in the first place. So I guess that's kind of where my journey started. Um, in 2018. Yeah, so at that time, um, I was working at Morgan Stanley, living in the city downtown, and, you know, it was a beautiful summer, I remember. We were, you know, down at the beach a lot. Um, we grew up going to um, a beach club down on Long Island, and, um, you know, working, living, doing all the normal stuff that a, you know, 25-year-old would do in Manhattan. So, um it was, it was, it was a good year. Yeah, it was, everything was status quo. Yeah, yeah. And more, you were, uh, you were senior in college, I think? Yeah, I was, you know, like Mark said, it was the August of 2019, or 2018. And I remember I had just finished, or I was like a week out of getting knee surgery, and I was getting ready to go back to school kind of the following day, or the following two days after um, Marguerite's, like, surgery and that was kind of the main thing on my radar and the most important thing at that time was just like how quickly can I get back to like being an athlete again and enjoying my senior year no uh no cause or concern for anything that may pop up yeah yeah so Marguerite you know I guess you you described it as what did you say stomach pain originally or yeah I mean it wasn't even stomach pain which was like the weird thing um I had always had I guess digestion issues if you will so it looked like I was pregnant without being pregnant uh so I originally went to a gastroenterologist because I it was the summertime and in a bathing suit, I very much like looked like I could have a baby there, like maybe five months. <laughs> um, and, but like, I'm a tiny person. So it definitely was a little odd. And when my friend's mom is a nurse and she was like, I don't think that's what you're supposed to be looking like. So went to the gastroenterologist and he had ordered a CT. Cause he's like, this is definitely not correct. Like something is in there and after grilling me asking if I was pregnant and constantly reassuring him that I was not um he ordered the CT and then I think maybe called me the day of like the scan was done and he's like you should make an appointment with a um, like an OBGYN type of person um like a um, gynecologist and so from there I was like yeah okay sure like I'll make one the first appointment they had was like a month down the road so I just kind of agreed to that. Um, and then my mom got on the phone with him and the uh, gastroenterologist was like, if this is my daughter, I would get her in to see someone ASAP. So he helped pull some strings and got me in with the doctor who's now my oncologist. I think that same week. And then from there kind of just was a snowball of a process. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just talk to us about the timing and, you know, how much time is going on between these appointments and mm-hmm. what's going on in your head as, 
things are progressing? Yeah, so I think I probably got that CT scan at the end of July. And then from there had my first doctor's appointment with the oncologist, probably at the beginning of August. So it was a short time in between that. And then from there, after an exam, like I think my parents both came to that first doctor's appointment because we're like, this is not, um, this is not going to be a normal checkup type of thing. And uh, they could identify that there was a mass on one of my ovaries, but they couldn't tell whether it was cancerous or not. That was obviously not determined until I went in and had my surgery. But at the time I was like, oh, it's going to be best case scenario. We're going to go in and it's going to be a cyst. Yeah. I You're was like, they're going to just suck it out. It's going to be outpatient. Like I'll be back. Oh, cause at that time, Mikhail and I were both training to run uh, the New York city marathon. So, wow. and she was kicking my butt in the training. Like I had just started and she was already on like 10 to 12 miles. And I was thinking to myself, how am I ever going to catch up to no. her? We ran one time and Mikhail was like sprinting ahead. I was like, I'm going to take my time. I'll see you in about three hours when I finish my run. Um, so at that time, like that was the only thing on my mind. I was like, okay, we'll go in. I may be put out for a week type of thing, but then I already paid the money to run the race and I was yeah. already training. So I was like, I got to do this. Uh, that obviously did not happen. Mikhail ended up running it, which was great for her. But um, so it was like beginning of August type of thing. And then... I had the kind of like a few other appointments and like scans in between uh, that beginning of August time and August 20th when I actually went to get the surgery, but I, it wasn't something you we were like advertising as like, oh, it's going to be cancer type of thing. It was more like, oh, it's going to be fine. And we'll just go in on a Monday and then I'll see you on a Tuesday. Obviously I had to tell my job that I was going to at least take like a week or so off. And I told my friends and everything like that in regards to like, I'm just going in for like a quick outpatient surgery, like nothing to be worried about. Uh, so I think I was pretty level-headed the entire time, like not mm -hmm. thinking, like I didn't go and I know or did I ever think I went to like the worst possible case scenario. Um, I just remember going in for my surgery and it was, uh, I think it's called an oophorectomy. So I had my uh, right ovary removed and my right fallopian tube removed. Um, and I had, this is like the, not, I guess the worst part of the story, because I went to DC the weekend beforehand to visit a friend, which I always forget. Um, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody I else remember. does. I um, remember. <laughs> so I was like, oh, this is going to be my last hurrah before the surgery. And I had to leave work, uh, like on a Thursday and I took Amtrak there and I was like feeling feverish. I was like, okay, I'll just take some Advil and we'll be okay. Um, and it wasn't until I got there that I was like, something is seriously wrong with me. And then at the time, I didn't know this. I thought it was just, again, like bad stomach pains. Um, but like the mass that had been growing finally burst, whatever that meant um, at the time. So I guess what they found out is it was like super friable so that it was easy to like break as it kept getting bigger and bigger. So that was terrible because it was like actual pain. That was the first time that I had felt it. Uh, but I took a tra Amtrak home earlier than I thought. And then I had to take a Long Island Railroad train home back to Long Island. And I was like, this is a hero's journey right now. The fact that I like made it in one piece without falling on the dirty floor of Penn Station was a true miracle. Uh, so it was a Saturday that 18th, 19th, 19th, my parents were like, we have to go to the emergency room. So we did. And again, the nurse, the ma the nurse of my friend's mom pulled some strings and like got me a bed ASAP and I was in a room and they just ran more tests and kind of confirmed what we already knew beforehand. And then since I was already in the hospital, I kind of just stayed there. And that next morning I was the first one to go in and have my surgery, which was nice because it was like 6 a.m. And they're like, let's do this. Uh, and then I don't, I mean, you guys were sitting there. I don't know how yeah. long the surgery took. It they was, were like countdown. Really it was a really long day. Um, and you know, but Mikhail, even, even before that, so before the surgery even started the day before we go and visit Marguerite in the emergency room and they tell us that, of course, Marguerite's like playing it off. She's like, I don't, it really hurts, but I'm sure it's fine. They're just going to like take it out and that'll be it. And they tell her that the surgery's going to be at 6am. And so I kind of look at her, I'm like limping along with my crutches too. And I'm like, 6am? You, you need me to be there for that? She was like, no, like I'll, I'll be home by 12. Don't worry about it. So then, 
of course, I was like, eh, I feel like maybe I should be there. She's like, no, like, don't, don't wake up. Like, I'll see you. I'll see you in a couple hours. Yeah. And we're like, okay. Like, I don't want to be up. So no one else should be so up. So we yeah. are going in the morning to the hospital to, you know, and they basically had to bring her from her room down to the cert where her surgery was. So we saw her in the room and then we saw her again in the pre um, surgical area. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, said goodbye and then um we went uh my mom my dad morgan and i sat in the lobby um at winthrop for it was you know i think the surgery didn't end up starting until like eight o'clock yeah there's a lot and of prep we there's a lot of yeah. you know, lag time um and you know she didn't come out of surgery until about four o'clock but we got a I don't remember that. We got a call, you know, halfway through because the doctor beforehand mm -hmm. in the morning was talking to us and Margaret was in a lot of pain at this time. Yeah. So I don't, I don't um, remember. I clearly, I don't remember a lot about um, that day, but like best case scenario, they were going to go in laparoscopically suck whatever mass was there up. And then it would have been just outpatient. And I guess yeah. soon so when they went when in, they went in and, do and the doctor called us from the lobby because they have to get permission from since, um, you know, my, from my parents or yeah. to open her up. So, and do a, um, bikini cut, yeah, like, and, a C -section. like a C section basically so that they could get a better visual and remove the mask. So, you know, that was a tough phone call to field and sitting there with my mom and it's probably the worst parents nightmare. I can't imagine we don't have children, but you know, to, you know, hear from a doctor that your child has cancer. Um, so, you know, we're sitting there and the doctor gives us the news and, you know, we're, are Did you, she tell you that it was cancer at that yeah, time? Yeah. Oh, guess so everybody we're knew sitting there and she, she says, you know, it, it is cancer. And we're like, are, can you say that again? <laughs> just to confirm, like, we need to know. Are okay. you sure? Are yeah, you? Yeah. And, uh, you know, so they did the surgery and they got everything out. So they did. But, uh, yeah, so they removed the right fallopian tube, right ovary, and then they took um, like little pieces of like other lymph nodes throughout my abdomen to see kind of if it had spread or not. Um, I think the mass, which is interesting, like ended up growing who knows how many like inches or centimeters, but it ended up being like 18 centimeters by the time they took it out, which in inches I have realized is like a pretty large size. Um, and then all I remember is waking up after that and someone giving me a ginger ale and saltines and them being like, do you want to see your family? And me being like, they're really nice people, but not right now. Because <laughs> I was just so out of it that I couldn't even remember like what happened. But this woman brought me ginger ale and I was like, you're an angel sent from heaven above. Like, I didn't even know what was coming out of my mouth. I'm not that nice to strangers. So it was <laughs> definitely an interesting experience. Um, but I just remember like then after that, I think I was like, passed out until I woke up like hours later back in my room. Um, and then I had like a terrible, terrible roommate and obviously like sleeping in the hospital is never fun. Um, and my roommate said she wanted to kill me and like wanted the nurses to kill me. So that like, that was a really interesting situation. <laughs> yeah. I was like, all I want to do is sleep right now. But uh, she was, she was moved elsewhere. Uh, <laughs> so that was like a good thing. Good. Yeah. But yeah, uh, you yeah. were in the hospital for I think three days. Yeah, and then yeah. Um, we. So do you do you find out that that at that point that have they told you that you have cancer? So when I eventually made it back up into my room again, I don't even know like the time frame of it. I just remember the the surgeon, my oncologist, came to me. And she's like, I want to let you know it's cancer. And I was like, okay, that's fine. Like, again, don't know what drugs I was on or if I was like still in that anesthesia phase and everything, but it like didn't process as if the world was ending, nor did I think it was, but it was very much like, okay, thank you for sharing. Like, I'm just going to go back to bed now. Um, so yeah, that was like how I, how I received the news. I don't know if I was maybe of like sound mind, I would have taken it to heart more. Uh, but I think after that I had, like, when I finally woke up, like the text message that some of my friends got, I was like, it's cancer. It's cool. We'll be fine. Like talk to you guys later. And now they're like, that was, why would you send us a text message? Like, <laughs> I was like, I don't really know how else I was supposed to tell you. I had been hyping it up that it was going to be great. And well, not great. I had to go in the hospital anyway, but I was like, it's going to be fine. And then unfortunately I had to be like, Hey, worst possible case scenario happened, but like, we're still good. 
Um, so it's like looking back, they're like, you were, that was the worst way to say any news. But knowing, knowing you, Marguerite, though, that actually fits perfectly <laughs> where it's some, some sort of big life changing information and just a quick text. No need for a call, <laughs> just a check in. 160 characters or less. Yeah. Yeah. Like a tweet. How, mm-hmm. uh, Michaela and Morgan, how are you guys? I mean, obviously you're, you know, mentally in a, in a lot. I mean, you can comprehend what's going on. You know, I, I I mean, can they tell at what stage is it at that point? Or is that, does that need more further? Yes, yes and no. For the most part, they were able to tell. I mean, I was only at stage one, which was thankful, um, but they needed to wait to see like what um, those like lymph nodes came back with seeing if it had spread. Um, But if it hadn't, then it would have just like stayed at stage one, which it did. But if it had, it would have been worse. So I think they like told me within, it was like stage one um, C3 type of thing. And the only reason it would had that like other numbers and letters to it was because it had the mass had like broke before um, I had gone into surgery. So maybe if it was done like a week beforehand, it could have been a different story. Um, but because it had broken and was friable, they needed to see if like any of the cancerous cells had spread at the end of the day. Um, but so yeah, stage one, and I can answer on Morgan's behalf. All I remember is that when the doctor, so the doctor finally came in and like had the entire family around, it was like kind of giving us the gist of what it would mean. Um, and Morgan's sitting there, she's like, I'm um, just a question. Is this like genetic? Well, will I get it too? Or how did that go, Morgan? It was something like that. I- Okay, I feel as though you're not giving me you're not giving me enough credit here. But mom had asked her her whole list of questions that she had been compiling over the entire day. I had the collection of Crawford puzzles that I completed while in the waiting room, and I think it was a very fair question to ask, as one should. And I answered I asked on behalf of Michaela as well because that's kind of she was thinking it too. And look what happened. <laughs> Not that they were related, but 10 months later, now it looks like Morgan didn't ask such a terrible question. <laughs> so that's one. And second, we're all just kind of sitting there and no one has a curtain question. So I was just kind of curious. I was like, excuse me. <laughs> I guess I don't think she expected to hear a question from me. But I was like, I was just wondering, is this genetic? Is this something that me and Mikhail have to be tested for or should be worried about? Which, okay, logical doctor question. Um, and she said, no. So that was a bit, I mean, there was already so much happening where, especially when like you have, like from my perspective, like Margaret is what, 23, 23, 22 years old. Yeah. And all of a sudden we just get this news. Like, first of all, thankful that we caught it early enough and that she was like living at home and that my parents like forced her to go to the doctor earlier and all this stuff. And she was able to take the Amtrak from DC back to Long Island and go to the hospital but you get this like life-altering news and all of a sudden like you don't know if you're gonna wake up tomorrow and like it's really gonna have happened or it's almost like oh that was a terrible dream or kind of just coming to terms with reality in it and I think that kind of like like asking like more questions or kind of like boiling it not boiling it down but just being curious about kind of like what the next steps are for yes Marguerite but then like our whole family because obviously like this news kind of changed our entire family and how we looked at things and so I just figured may as well ask the question before something else happens down the road people are mad that I didn't ask the question yeah and I mean it was so it was a germ cell tumor um which is like the type of I guess cancer that it was and the good news was is that it wasn't genetic. Like there was no, we weren't predisposed to this or I wasn't predisposed to this and you weren't predisposed to your situation. Um, so thankfully Mikkel and Morgan were off the hook and it is less common, um, in younger people. So I was definitely like the youngest one on my, um, oncology hall. There was like 65 year olds I was hanging out with. Um, but it is more common as you get older, which is like similar to yours, but at least, if there is a silver lining, even though you ended up getting cancer as well, it wasn't genetic, but we still don't know where it came from, but not genetic. Still not a dumb question. Still yeah. not a dumb question. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, obviously you have hindsight right now, but uh, I'm curious about your mental health as you find out about these things. And, and then I guess, you know, maybe talk to us about the next couple of months and and 
year as as they went forward how you know how much is it in and out and and things of that nature mm -hmm. I would say that honestly the worst part was being in the hospital for the three days I felt like I had to be in like some back alley establishment and the hospital was totally fine but I think it like took a toll on just like being in the room and not being able to like get out of bed without anybody helping me um and then when I came back from the hospital I was at, at my parents and I remember just like not being able to walk up a flight of stairs without a, like needed to be carried by Mikhail or like even shower by myself, which was just like, so that was a fun experience. Yeah. <laughs> like I had to put like saran wrap around my abdomen. I was like keeled over. Like I couldn't even stand up. So like the physical aspect of it for me, I feel like was the most shocking of it. Cause again, I was training for a marathon. So like in my mind to then not be able to walk. And there's some like really ghastly photos of my legs that <laughs> like cankles galore and I was like yeah cut them off I was like something that you got to get rid of them I don't want to look at them um but I mean I was for those first few weeks I was just sitting in a chair maybe walking from that chair to the front door to the chair again to the kitchen um I had to um, have blood thinners. So I had to like inject myself in my thighs with blood thinners at the beginning of it so that I didn't get blood clots. And I mean, I've gotten shots before, but having to like, what I called it, stab myself in the thigh was just like, a, a like I had to like push past that barrier of like a mental thing of like, I'm physically inflicting pain on myself. Um, that lasted five seconds and it ended up being fine. Um, but it was, I think I had to do that for like 30 days after. And then very quickly after that, uh, I started the process of egg retrieval. So we didn't know if the chemo, when I started it, was going to do anything to like the remaining ovary that I had. So we were set up with a fertility specialist who kind of walked us through the process of it. And by us, I mean my mom and I. And I was like, I don't need to freeze my eggs. Like I'm 23 and single. And my mom's like, you should definitely do it. I was like, um, no. Anyway, I ended up doing it and I had to like sign over basically my eggs. And I was like, oh, I'll just sign them over to my mom. Like if anything should happen to me from chemo and the doctor was like, I don't, most people don't do that. Cause like if you die and then like the mom goes crazy and then like she uses your eggs to make like new children. I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, I don't think my mom would do that, but okay. So Mikhail is now the proud owner of my <laughs> eggs. Should anything happen? Um, so that was, probably, I didn't want them anyway. Yeah, Morgan, didn't, Morgan was like, I'm 21. I'm in college. Like, I don't need little children. No, I wasn't even asked. It was just that uh, Mikhail was like, oh yeah, I got him. And I was like, was, it, was there a debate? Was there a discussion? She was like, no. I was like, okay. And to I, be mean, fair, I called Mikhail and I was like, you want my eggs? And she's like, sure, sure. And that was it. Yeah. To be fair, I would have picked Mikhail as well. That's uh, understandable. Yeah. yeah. Everybody <laughs> would pick Mikhail. But, uh, so that was probably like two weeks and that again, I was like the youngest person in the, uh, I guess, doctor's office there as well. And everybody was like, with the nurses and everything, you would have to go in pretty frequently after you were like taking these injections. And usually they have you inject on your abdomen. Is that what you did? Like in the yeah. stomach area, like where you have like more fat. Um, but since I had just had that surgery and I still was like very immobile, um, my mom actually had to be the one that like injected me with like the hormones and everything in the back of my arm so again I had just shot myself in the leg and now my mom's being the one that's responsible for basically shooting me in my arm fat and that was for her I mean you would have to ask her but I she was freaking out she's like I don't know how I'm supposed to again like stab my daughter with what's supposed to be helpful um and, yeah, and I think run. you know eventually when I went through this process I also did fertility treatments mm -hmm. but um it's pretty amazing you know the fact that they have the technology and the science to, you know, do these fertility treatments and, you know, freeze your eggs. And mm -hmm. I, Marguerite got 20. I have 22 frozen yeah, eggs. And I have 12. So, you know, you know, fortunately for us, um, you know, we did have to go through chemotherapy, but we do still, and both of us should still be able to conceive naturally, mm -hmm. but the just having that safety net yeah, the of, you know god forbid anything happened um i think is just kind of a you know peace of mind and even when i was going through it my doctor said you should still be able to conceive naturally but 
for me, I just, I didn't want to take the risk and there's so many resources out there. Fortunately, my insurance covered it. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's so many resources like Livestrong. Um, I know specifically will help to cover the costs for fertility treatments if you're going through cancer. So, um, you know, if, if there is other people out there uh, who are listening, we're going through this, you know, that's something that, you know, we would definitely um, encourage because you just never know what's going to happen in the future. So it's just good to have, you know, the peace of mind. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> I, I guess. Yeah. Sorry. You, do you want to speak any, any more of, I guess the, the first year. And I mean, I don't know at what point Michaela, your story begins. And I, I, mean, I can, I can well, keep going a little bit more because then okay. it transitions smoothly yeah. into her, unfortunately <laughs> with not a lot of time in between. Yeah. Um, but so then after I froze my eggs, which I think was like a two to three week process, I started chemo, um, in October, uh, beginning of October of 20, 18. So I have what, this what did the doctors tell you at, at this point? I mean, what in terms of worst case scenario, what what are the, what are they saying to you? Um, I guess like worst case scenario was I could die, but they were never like at that point. No, <laughs> no, they did not say that. Oh, let's, no, I'm kidding. Let's they did take not that say that. that. <laughs> they my there was a for at least my situation since they had removed the um Morgan shaking her head since they had removed the tumor and it had not spread I was going to just go through the chemo process and basically it was just like the side effects would have been like worst case scenario so feeling nauseous feeling run down um I mean through the drugs that I was getting there was like a list of 75 plus side effects. It's the worst thing reading the actual yeah. description of what these drugs like have 20 in them. page packets of them. And yeah. I'd be like, thank you, mom. Here you go. <laughs> like, I read everyone cover to cover. I like started. I was like, okay, this could happen. No. Um, no. but so I had I was supposed to go, well, I guess I was supposed to, and I did go through three different cycles. So um my first one was a week long. I would get uh chemo every single day from like nine to five, we'll say, uh, just like a normal job, you know? Yeah. And uh, so I was the first week and I, the first day it was three different types. And then the second week I just had to go in one day. And then third week I would just have to go in one day as well. But each day that you go in or that you have it, they kind of check your blood levels and where you're at. So mine ended up, my treatment that they had originally planned ended up changing because I had really um, low white blood cell count. And then I was getting some certain side effects. Like one was tinnitus, which is just like ringing in your ears. Uh, so we had to change one of the, uh, drugs because I didn't want to go deaf at 23 <laughs> along with everything else that was going on. Um, so which kind of shortened the chemo process as well. So instead of five days in the first week, it was three days. Um, I felt nauseous, but they had like all these steroids and like take home medicine, basically that, um, you can take to kind of combat that. The worst thing that happened to me, I guess, besides getting cancer was I did end up losing my hair. They said I had like a seven to 77% chance. So good odds there. Um, and I remember like I, during the second round was when it started to fall out and I just gotten like a haircut the Friday beforehand. And then I saw it on the pillow on a Tuesday and on the next Friday, I was like, we're shaving it off and we're not going to worry about the hair coming back. And now I have hair. So it's great. But I would say the, um, the hair loss and then the nausea were like the worst parts of it. But I ended my treatment uh, November of 2018. So it was a pretty quick process. Um, and then after that, it was just the recovery of it. And January, we went to Florida for a month and then lived life at home for its fullest. And then May, would you say? for can, can, so, can, I, can I just ask one more question? Of course. You know, you, you sound like a, a pretty independent person. So I'm curious, you know, not being in control and, you know, just that that time period. I mean, I, I assume you weren't going to work, obviously, you know, and I'm not sure, you know, you see all your friends partying on the weekends and things like that. I mean, how did you keep yourself 
sane or I mean, <laughs> any tips, you can say it's sane. <laughs> yeah any tips to you know on on the, I mean because you know you just you just see all your friends just you know living carefree and mm-hmm. and you're going through this serious thing I mean I'm sure it was tough to even just go on social media I'm sure yeah well I think I may be the exception to the rule because at that time I was a 23 year old in an 85 year old's body and lifestyle. <laughs> so yeah. um, I don't have like any social media. So I gratefully didn't get to see any of that. Um, but I kept seeing through crossword puzzles and, oh, word searches. I'm sorry. Word searches. Word searches. Um, I was, re- I love to read. So that was like my escape from reality. Um, but I also wanted to hear how like other people's lives were doing because like, I don't want to just talk about myself. That's like my least favorite topic. Um, so like hearing about what people were doing, like allowed me to still, I guess, like be active in that regard. And also I had like friends that were coming to like visit and even just like sit down and catch up and everything. And I actually was still working. So I was working from home before it was cool. We um, oh but I, it was like, I worked for like a, um, an online media company, if you will. So I, yeah. I like edited articles and stuff, which was during the weeks where I had those chemo treatments, I didn't work, but like during my off weeks, it still allowed me to like be in touch with reality. Um, and to that point, I like started the process of like, reapplying to grad school and everything like that so I I tried to keep as normal as possible in the routine that I could which I feel like was what helped me like continue to pretend like this not pretend like it wasn't happening but also not have it overshadow my entire life and like define me of who I was um but there were definitely moments when I was like wow this this really sucks. We're going to go through this again. And it's going to be like another day of the same exact thing. And then I'm going to be tired. Uh, but again, I said, I was 85 years old. I was like, Whew, bed by eight. This is a dream. <laughs> if only I didn't have to wake up and do the chemo the entire next day. But I would say like keeping that normal schedule and having that support system in place was what helped this like quote unquote nightmare not feel so unbearable. And as terrible as it sounds, we have a circle of people who um, have had different cancers than us, but also could like be there um, to kind of share their experiences to know that like it wouldn't have been the end of the world. So I feel like that was helpful as well. In a situation like that, how how should friends, uh, I mean, maybe even family, how should friends and family, how can they support you? Because I feel like it can be a tough you know, obviously family is going to be there through everything, but, you know, friends might not know how to approach the situation. Any pieces of advice on, you know, a friend supporting someone who's going yeah, through? I, I think the biggest thing, at least, you know, from my experience was, you know, obviously when everyone finds out this horrible news, they kind of don't know what to say to you. Um, but it's better to say something than to say nothing. Mm-hmm. And I think the biggest thing is, you know, I never wanted to hear that you're they, I'm so sorry to hear like, yeah, it, it sucks, but you know, just, I'm thinking about you, you know, positive reinforcement and some people may not like that, but for me, like, you know, I didn't want to talk about my chemo treatments or anything like that. I wanted to hear what was going on in the normal world. How was work? Did you go to any cool restaurants? Have you been to any concerts lately? Is there, you know, what's new in your life? And, you know, more having those kind of conversations so you didn't feel like you were you know missing out on a year of your life which you know you kind of are when you're going through this depending on whether or not you are working or still you know doing your normal routine quote unquote um I think the biggest thing is just being there and being supportive and you know really for me like I was happy to have people come and visit me during chemotherapy and um just sit there with me. Like I, I didn't ask them to come. They said, can I come? And I said, yes. And some people don't want people to be there. So I think, you know, just have that conversation and it's something just to have a candid conversation about. Yeah. I think for friends, I mean, Morgan, Mikhail, and my mom, I think we're the gatekeepers of a lot of information. So I like ran my own personal blog during that time to like get the info out. But I also didn't feel like I had a lot of people coming to me and be like, what's going on? How are you type of thing? Or like, 
what's the treatment status. So for me, I was like, this is great. But for them, they were the ones that were like fielding all of those questions. So I feel like if you- We were basically Marguerite's PR people. Yeah, I had <laughs> yes. like a secretary. That's this correct. Great. They were like, they were, when we, we'd have like a text that we'd send, like people would reach out to either me or Morgan. And I, we were like, don't reach out to my mom or Marguerite, come to us. Leave them alone. Leave them be, <laughs> here's the message, send. All yeah. right, we're good. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was great to be in my shoes because I didn't know that they were getting all this information. And then Michaela gets sick and I'm like, people are so annoying. Like they have so many <laughs> questions. Mm. Like, why are they asking? asking? I was like, this never happened to me. And they're like, no, it did. We just answered all of them for you. So it's definitely like a role reversal there. And I, I think like you said, like people don't know what they to say, but they should say something. Like I had friends that like didn't say anything. And I was like, okay, well, you're no longer my friend because this is like the biggest thing going on in my life right now. And you can't even acknowledge it. Um, so, it, I mean, true colors really came out in certain people and certain people stepped up and came out of the woodwork. And I knew it was only going to be maybe for this time period and other people now a few years later have still stuck around that I didn't talk to beforehand. Um, and then you just experience new um, things with these people that I feel like um, allows you to see who your real friends are. And even just like the simple act of like sending a funny text message or like a candle or someone made me a video. And I was like, wow, that was so sweet. And I would have never thought that you liked me like that. So that was a good like self-confidence boost there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think kind of what going from the perspective of a two time supporting family member, <laughs> thank you guys very much. <laughs> um, the, the, the biggest thing about it, I think, kind of Mikhail touched on it, is just being there. I think um, I wasn't able to, I had just had knee surgery, so I was kind of ineligible to play like my whole fall season when Marguerite was going through this. So I was very candid with my coach. And I was like, listen, so I went to school um, down in Baltimore. I was like, listen, I. I'm not, I'm just going to be standing on the sidelines and practice. Like there's really nothing for me to do. Like physically, I guess, to be a part of the team aside from just being there. Like I would like to go back home, like for the weeks that my sister has her chemo treatments, if that's possible, if it's okay to miss practice. And um, I mean, she was just the sweetest woman in the world about it. She was like, yeah, of course, like don't even worry about it. So um, I think I was able to go to two out of three of your sessions, Marguerite, and just sit with you and just kind of, hang out and it doesn't really matter a lot more than three sessions <laughs> no like the week oh okay yes I was like yeah, yeah. but I think you, you and mom came oh and you came too but like it yeah. wasn't like I didn't have friends visiting I was like my, yeah. my mom's got it they like they can handle it but even just like we didn't obviously talk the whole time we just kind of just like I sat there in your presence and we did our even word after, <laughs> yeah we did our word searches I picked your butt um and even after that just having when people decide to like, come over and pop in and chat or just like when Michaela was sick and I think I went over to her apartment like one night we just hung out like watched a movie and like talked about your day like you didn't have to bring up cancer at all but just kind of like being there and kind of being an option for someone to talk to and just showing like the physical presence or just showing that your support and that you're there for them whatever you need it's just it's nice to have someone no one ever wants to go through this alone and no one ever should yeah. yeah. And also asking like what we wanted. I feel like no one was just, sometimes I feel like people were saying things to make themselves feel better if I'm going to be mm -hmm. honest. And I was like, well, I don't need your pity or like, I don't need you to feel like you need to reach out to me. Like if you want to like be there. Um, but I think that for the most part, like the friends that are our closest friends, like knew what we needed and other people I'm like, okay, you're just doing this to make yourself feel better. And like, I don't, I don't need that from you because like, this is my journey, not yours type of thing. Yeah. So Michaela, do you want to start talking about yourself? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, after Marguerite got sick, I was, and I had just turned 26 in 2018. So I was like, man, I'm going to be on my own insurance. I might as well go get a physical, do all the things, you know, check all the boxes. Um, to say, you know, I'm in good health. We had just gone through this big thing with Marguerite being sick. So I was just, you know, doing my homework. I got a physical, got my blood work back. Everything was great. I was the picture of health. Um, and I um, had been working out a lot and I um, had felt the lump underneath my arm when I was in the shower. 
Um, and I kind of brushed it off and was like, man, I'm sure it's nothing. I've been working out a lot. I must have like, you know, pulled the muscle because it wasn't really like in my breast. It was very much underneath my armpit. So um, I was I had already scheduled my annual um, gynecology checkup um, with my OBGYN. So I, and that was in, in the beginning of May. So I was like, you know what, I'll just, you know, push it. I'll, I'll wait. It's nothing. I'm sure it's nothing to be alarmed about. And I had reached out to one of my friends who had had a couple cysts in her breasts. And I was like, listen, I have this thing. I'm, I feel it, but I don't really know. Like, what did yours feel like? And she said, you know, they felt like little peas. And I was like, okay, great. That's what mine feels like. It was like a little hard. It felt like a frozen pea almost. So I was like, okay, I'm sure it's, you know, something similar to that. So I went in for my annual checkup and, you know, I'm definitely not somebody who is a candidate for getting breast cancer um, because the average breast cancer patient is 55 to 60 years old. Um, and you know, as someone who has, you know, or is going through menopause or has gone through menopause, um, or has like a genetic disorder, or has uh, a genetic disposition. So, you know, we have no family history of breast cancer and Marguerite's cancer, um, you know, isn't genetic. So we, you're welcome guys. Uh, <laughs> so we, I didn't think, you know, immediately in my head, I wasn't thinking, oh, I must have breast cancer. So I went in for my annual, um, my annual checkup. And during those checkups, they always do a breast exam. And the doctor said, Oh, I feel this lump. I said, you know, I felt it as well, but you know, I didn't think to do anything of it. She said, I think it's fine, but just in case you might as well go get it checked out. So I went in to, um, have an ultrasound. So from the ultrasound, they determine whether or not they want you to come back and get a biopsy. So me thinking, you know, I'm, I work on wall street. I, you know, work, a lot of hours, very busy. And I was thinking, oh, I'll just pop off the desk for, you know, a quick scan and I'll be back in like an hour. Uh, and I told my partner, it's like, hey, cover me. Like, I'll be right back. And um, I was not right back um, because, so I went in and I didn't even bring my purse. Like I brought my wallet with my insurance card and like my phone. I'm thinking to myself, I'll be in and out, no problem. And not realizing that these things, no matter what, it's yeah. always a process. And I was very impatient at the time. And throughout this whole process, I definitely learned a lot of patience. Um, and I was like, listen, I got to go. I got to meet clients tonight. I was so ready to like move on to the next thing. And so I, you know, they do the ultrasound, you wait in the room with the gown on, and, you know, I'm sitting there waiting and the, the radiologist comes in and he says, you know, we'd like to get a biopsy. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Uh, you know, when, and then of course me type A, I was like, all right, when's the soonest that you can do this? And they said, oh, I actually have a spot right now. I was like, great, perfect. Let me just call my boss. So I called him to let him know that I, I you know, was going to be a little bit longer and, you know, I'm not even going you know, DEF CON 5 yet. And I'm just like, okay, let me get this done. I didn't really tell anybody because I was like, listen, I'm going to go get this done. Yeah. It's I not think I met be, up with you after you got it done. It's not going to be anything. I'll be fine. So I got the, um, the biopsy that day. Um, they do like a needle biopsy. So they uh, basically just take a long needle. They take a little piece of it. Um, and then, you know, the radiologist said, you know, you'll hear back in like two to three days. I was, and this is a, uh, a Thursday. So I, I incessantly called the radiology department at Northwell to be like, so did you get Michaela Ricks calling again? Uh, did you get anything? And they, you know, said no. And um, I, at that point, when I went home on Friday and I was talking to the nurse, this is so silly of me because I was like, so like, am I going to be able to play golf this weekend? Like my family, it's supposed to be a beautiful weekend. And she looked at me and she goes, I, yes, but you know, you probably shouldn't. I was like, well, you know, I, it'll be fine. I'm fine. I was an athlete. Like I can take this, and, uh, you know, I'll be okay. So, um, you know, at that point I kind of decided that it was the right thing to do to tell my family that I had had this biopsy and, you know, we actually chose not to tell Morgan because this was her senior year of college and um, she was, we had just gone through all this with Marguerite and we really didn't know anything. So we didn't want to raise any alarm bells yet. And, um, you know, then over the next couple of weeks, um, I did actually, um, when I was in the room with the radiologist and I was like, 
my sister just went through cancer. Is this something that I should be worried about? And he said, yes. So I was like, great, super. Um, <laughs> this is really good news. So, you know, after that, I, you know, found out actually um, on a Monday afternoon, uh, it was May 20th. Um, they called the radiologist called me. I just remember being at like four o'clock. Um, and you know, let me know that it was cancer. Um, it was invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, they didn't know the stage at that point because they can't really tell until they do additional tests. So, you know, from there, I hung up with the doctor. I called my mom, my dad, my sisters, my boyfriend, and my aunt. Um, so not me. I called, no, I didn't call you. No, you did uh, not. I called Marguerite. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, to let them know. And then I immediately hung up and got on the phone with Sloan Kettering um, Cancer Center because Morgan Stanley, where I work, had a partnership with them. And I had actually, when Marguerite was going through the treatment, you know, use that channel to help her get a second opinion, um, just, you know, to have that check. Um, and so I ended up getting and meeting with doctors at Sloan Kettering and uh, Cornell in the city. And Wait, can you can you just talk about how you're doing? You know, you get this news. <laughs> I was kind of on like, OK, great let me figure out what's going on. And for me, I was, I'm very, very organized and type A. I was like, okay, when's the first day I can get in to see a doctor? So I ended up getting in uh, June 6th or June 5th at Cornell and June 6th at Sloan. Um, but, you know, then you're on the phone calling everybody to say, okay, what, you know, what's the process from here? Because it was a little different from Marguerite's situation where she went into surgery and then found out that she had cancer. I found out that I had cancer and then had to figure out what I needed to do. Um, which for me, I was thinking, okay, well, if this was any, like if I was playing for a meeting or a game or whatever, what am I, what's the game plan gonna be here? What's the first step? Okay, first step, I need to go see a doctor. So yeah, this was like a business transaction for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I was, so I basically, you know, my mom called, I, I, I after I called everybody, I got on the phone. She's trying to call me back. I was like, can't talk to you right now. And I had, by the time that I actually spoke to her, like later in the night, I had already had like doctor's appointments set up and she was, she called me back. She goes, so listen, this is what I'm thinking. Like I already took care of it. Um, so for me, you know, one, I didn't really tell a lot of other people away from my immediate circle because we had just gone through this and I really didn't want the whole world knowing that I also had cancer because I was like, I just want to get through this as quickly as possible and, you know, move on with my life. She's, uh, that, that, your process, I feel like was a lot more tight lipped, like until after it. Yeah. I feel like then we started telling people when you're like, you're good. But in the beginning, I was like, if you know, you're taking it to the grave. Yeah. And we, uh, so I ended up meeting with the doctor at, um, Cornell and I went into you know, every hospital does it a little bit differently. So, and one of the biggest things is I think, fortunately, Marguerite had a good experience with her doctor initially mm -hmm. at uh, Winthrop, but the first doctor that I met at Cornell and the, the process there is very different than it was at Sloan. So at Sloan, um, you know, I went in, they did the, all of my scans before I even met with the doctor. So you basically have a whole day, they set you up for mammogram, um, an MRI, I did for, um, genetic testing, and then they do a bunch of blood work. So then that was all in the morning. And then at two o'clock, I had a meeting with the doctor, which was really nice because, you know, you go in and you have all these tests done and then you, you know, at least the doctor has some kind of imaging or results to have a conversation with you. And um, when I met with the doctor at Cornell, and I'm not saying anything bad, it's a world-class hospital, but I just did not have a good experience. Yeah. You have um, to find a doctor that's right for you. And, and you have to know. find, you know, the right fit and you, you got to shop your doctor, like mm -hmm. find mm -hmm. the person um, that works for your personality and things that you, you know, find important. Um, so I ended up, um, going uh, to this meeting at Cornell and they said, you know, this is an optional informational session. And I was like, okay, it's optional. Optional means you don't have to go. And so I didn't like RSVP that I was going because I was working and I was like, I have to work. I can't take the time off. And, you know, I have a very 
stressful job. And I, at the time, I didn't think that I needed to go to this. So the nurse uh, from the group called me early in the morning. She said, you know, I, I think it'd be really good if you came to this meeting. So I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, sure, I'll, I'll go to the meeting. And so I didn't tell my mom, I was like, just meet me at three o'clock for the appointment. I'm, you know, I'll just go sit in there and do the information session. And, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. So I go in and they, they play this video with all of the stuff, like the side effects of having breast cancer and the surgery and basically like things that are in a really nicely put together video that you're sitting there like, oh my God, what is going on? And I was sitting there, you know, a 26 year old by myself mm -hmm. with all of these other breast cancer patients with their support person. And I was like, uh, you know, I'm taking notes on my, my Morgan Stanley notepad and people are in the room looking at me. And of course I was late because I was rushing right. from a meeting and I, you know, show up there and they do the whole thing. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I really shouldn't have come to this by myself. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the meeting ends and this, this very nice man came up to me and just put his hand on my shoulder and wished me. He said, uh, I wish you the best of luck oh, God. because he was like, this poor kid is here by herself going through all this stuff. And it was crazy, but we ended up, you know, seeing the doctor there. And then the next day at Sloan went significantly better. Um, and I met with uh, Dr. Geminiani who ended up being my surgeon who was excellent. I, I really connected with her right away. And she kind of laid out all the options for me just based on, um, you know, the information that we had known at the time. So, you know, at, once you're going to determine what your surgery is, you know, you also, I also met with a plastic surgeon as well as a breast surgeon. So if you do end up having reconstruction, you're going to meet with both a plastic surgeon um, and a breast surgeon. So um, I ended up having a lumpectomy. So basically they just removed the um, the cancerous area. Um, and then I had a sentinel lymph node biopsy, which um, they'll test the lymph nodes around where the cancer was growing to see if the cancer has spread to other parts of your body. So that also helps really determining the staging of the cancer. What's so the, what's the time period on this? So that um, I ended up having uh, my initial meeting with Dr. Gemignani on June 6th. Um, and then in between that, I had a bunch of other appointments. So I met the plastic surgeon. I had um, fertility tests, not fertility, um, genetic? genetic testing, um, because I wanted to know whether or not I was BRCA positive, um, which would, for me, really determine what kind of surgery that I was going to have. Because if I was uh, BRCA positive, they would have recommended to have a double mastectomy, um, which is a surgery where they move all, both of your breasts. Um, and unfortunately for me, I did not have to do that. Um, and I had a lumpectomy because, um, I, uh, when I had the MRI, it showed that the, there was no cancer in my other breast. It was just on the left side. And then, um, they found another spot in my breast, but, and, and turned out to not be cancerous. So they ended up just doing the lumpectomy. Um, so my options really, when I was just deciding were lumpectomy or single mastectomy. So you can have one or both removed. So I chose to do a lumpectomy and my surgeon actually did an excellent job. I only have a small scar underneath my armpit, um, which was, you know, I was very fortunate and she did, you know, an excellent job. I, I didn't even have stitches. Um, so then, so my surgery was July 1st. So after the surgery, they take the tumor and they send it um, to get this uh, test called the ANCA test. And that basically will determine, it'll give you a score. Um, and that score will determine, you know, whether or not they think chemotherapy will be beneficial for you to increase your longevity. And for me, um, they, you want your score to be under 18. My score was 21. So I was very close. Um, so um, in the, in the interim, I met with an oncologist because regardless of, um, whether or not I needed chemo or what that score was going to be, I was going to have to take some kind of hormone therapy, which I'm still taking today. Um, and we, <laughs> and so we, <laughs> yeah, take your time. Uh, so I ended up meeting with two oncologists at Sloan. The first one, just, we did not gel. It was not a rather right fit for me. Uh, he was very dry and very, this is what we're doing. This is what we're going to do. 
this is the game plan. This is the time frame. This is your treatment. You're going to lose your hair. You're going to probably have to not work. And I was like, yeah. no, have a nice life. I was like, no, that's, I need you to be bubbly. Find out about my life. What, yeah. you know, what, yeah. what I like, what I don't like, be my friend. So I ended up meeting Dr. Goldfarb, who ended up being my oncologist and she's amazing. I love her. I speak to her frequently and she has a great team. Uh, one and her PA is, her name's Brittany. She was getting married at the time. So it was great. We, and she's my age. So we had a lot of commonalities to talk, uh, to talk through. So ended up, um, going with Dr. Goldfarb and she, she's been excellent. So we came up with the plan that I was going to do four chemotherapy treatments of TC, which is TC stands for the two drugs, um, Taxol and Cyclophosphamide. Uh, um, don't ask me how to spell it. Never will. Be. <laughs> um, and I also did fertility treatments in that time. So I had surgery July 1st. I did the fertility treatments in the middle of July. And then I was starting, I started chemotherapy August 19th, but then I had an allergic reaction to the taxol. So I ended up, um, one of the nurses at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Nora was her name. Uh, she was amazing. She was walking by the room and uh, in the first few moments of the chemo, your body kind of will have a reaction obviously to it being in your, in your blood. And one of the side effects of the Taxol, which was the first drug that they were um, doing in the drip is that you can have your nails and toes can get your fingernails and toenails can get brittle. So they put ice packs on your hands during the treatment so that that doesn't to help prevent that from happening. And I was looking down at my feet and all of a sudden I couldn't breathe. And the nurse was Nora was walking by and had the, had the, uh, the charge nurse who was in my room, um, stop the medication. And I went into anaphylactic shock. So it was, um, definitely, definitely a scary way to start chemotherapy. And, um, I was also doing the cold cap, which is this amazing technology that you basically wear a giant ice pack on your head throughout, uh, for 30 minutes before your treatment throughout your whole treatment and up to 90 minutes after. And that is supposed to help prevent hair loss. So they told me initially that I would probably lose my hair with this chemotherapy treatment. So I said, okay, are there any options? Uh, we went to see um, a person Wig who makes maker. wigs. And because I, for me, my hair has always been a very big thing for me. And I really would not, don't think I would have taken that well. So I wanted to do everything that I could to make sure that I still had my hair. So um, the cold cap is, it, it was really for me, really helped. And I only had hair, hair looks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I only had hair thinning. So I lost a lot, some hair in my hairline, but throughout my treatment, I, I really didn't lose much hair. You wouldn't really have been able to tell that I was going through cancer treatments. And so after that initial, um, incident incident with the allergic reaction, I ended up having to change my chemotherapy regimen. So instead of four treatments every three weeks. I had to do eight treatments every two weeks. So of a different drug combination. So it was CMF um, was the combination. And fortunately that my doctor said it was kind of chemo light. Um, so a lot of patients, even if they didn't use the cold cap did not lose their hair, which it, for me, I was like, super, that's great news. Um, but it was a harder regimen on your fertility. So it was a really good thing that I had froze my eggs beforehand. And so I went through the eight chemotherapy treatments and I think, you know, it was a long time, you know, I, not that Marguerite's was very different, but, you know, I found out in, um, May and I didn't finish my treatment until the end of January of 2020. Yeah, and I would say mine was more frequent, but like more often versus like well, yours. Mine was like a daily thing versus like you prolonged. Right. So it. I went one day. Not every, like either of them is a better option. Yeah. So just depending on the regimen. Yeah. Um, but I went one day every two weeks. And then I also had to do radiation after the chemotherapy was over because they couldn't do them simultaneously. So since I had the lumpectomy, instead of the single mastectomy, I had to do radiation. Um, so I did the 
eight chemotherapy treatments. And I think really some of the worst side effects were constipation. Um, you know, it's all of those drugs really will do things to your body and obviously beat the cancer, but you know, you really have to prepare yourself for, you know, before, during, and after, because you would go through it and, you know, up until the two weeks would go by. And then when I had treatment on Monday, that Sunday before I would feel totally fine and normal. And then you kind of go through the cycle again. So, you know, definitely a lot of fatigue, some nausea, but they, they do a really good job now of pairing. They give you anti-nausea medication during your treatment and then stuff to go home with. So, um, there was, they were preparing you for not feeling well. And I think the biggest thing for me is you don't have to suffer through not feeling well. Mm-hmm. If you're not feeling good and you feel nauseous or take you're tired, drugs. take the drugs because there were the, you know, or the constipation medicine yeah. or the nausea medicine or Advil or whatever. And you got to take it like you. before you start feeling the side effects. Yes. Cause like the first day I was nauseous and I was like, I don't have the drugs. Like they didn't like CV. It didn't go through with CVS and my parents were calling the doctors up that was on call. And then as soon as I got it from then on, I was like, as soon as like you feel it or you think you're going to be nauseous just because of your dosage that day, like you got to take it or you're going to be suffering, but you can already like stop the suffering before it starts. So, yeah. so, um, you know, and I think I, at some point, I, and I remember this, it was after my sixth treatment. Fortunately, I had a bunch of my friends because Sloan Kettering is right in the city. So everyone kind of was there and they kind of triaged and everyone kind of took a turn and came to a different one of my treatments, which was really, really nice. I, I would send an email update to my friends and I had my celebrity guests for the day. So it was nice to have, um, friends and family come and just so that you could talk about normal things instead of, you know, sitting there, you know, while they're putting poison in your body. Um, and after the sixth treatment, I was kind of sitting there with my mom and I was just thinking to myself, okay, I'm, I'm tired. I'm done with this. You know, I had two more to go. It was, it had already been three months and, or two months. And I was just, I was ready to get back to life. And, you know, the last, the last two treatments, I was like, okay, it's one, one and a bonus. Okay. It's one and done. So it was just kind of changing my mentality instead of thinking, oh my gosh, this is so long to it's one more. Okay. Then, you know, once that was over, it was, it was December 2nd was my last chemo. Um, so I really had a couple weeks to recover before I started radiation. And, you know, at this point, uh, I had chosen when I was initially going through this to take a leave of absence from work. Um, because just with my job, it, it would have been too difficult to manage, you know, not feeling well. And I didn't really want any of my clients to kind of know what I was going through because it is a very personal thing. I did tell my entire group, I work with, um, directly with about a hundred people and, you know, I, I did announce it in our morning meeting because I just would have rather them hear it from me, um, you know, what I was going through instead of hearing it through the grapevine and then not knowing whether or not to reach out. So I, you know, announced it to the group in our morning meeting and kind of said, listen, I'm going through this. I'm going to be out of the office for the next few months. I'll be back. You know, it was stage one. So mine was stage one, um, treatable, curable, but, you know, please don't, you know, come up and ask me about it. I don't really want to talk about it. I just want to, you know, get through it and be able to move on with my life. So fortunately, um, you know, I did go back to work in January of 2020 while I was still going through radiation treatments and everyone that I, uh, work with was super supportive and, um, you know, I, I would leave early from work and if I didn't feel well, I would, they would, were totally fine with my going home. They were just very happy to have me back. And so I finished radiation January 31st. We had a, a, a real big celebration. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Um, and so, you know, I had, I, when the global pandemic hit, yeah. uh, I had only been back at work for, you know, two months at that point. So was very fortunate to have, you know, the flexibility to then be able to work from home in a job that traditionally we weren't able to. So it was definitely a, a crazy couple of years, but you know, that we kinda, keep saying the next year is going to be better for us. <laughs> and like something else. Happened. It. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's, you know, after uh, my treatment was over, you know, I didn't really broadcast it to a lot of people because I just wanted to 
get through it and, you know, move on and didn't really know how I felt about it yet. You know, I hadn't really, I, I obviously thought about it because I was going through it, but I hadn't really thought about the way that I wanted to talk about it. Um, because obviously us both going through it and our family going through it, it was just finding the, the impact or the reason why or what we could do to make a difference um, you know, didn't really come until after that was all over. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and I, my email, uh, message that I would send out, um, after my chemotherapy treatments, I labeled fight like a girl. So, you know, that was kind of my inspiration behind it and for my email. And then we kind of translated onto that and we did the fundraiser at Pure Bar. Yeah, because well, um, when I was going through it, Michaela- Michaela, can I just ask one question before you get into that? You know, with yours being so much longer of a time period, mm -hmm. I'm just curious, you know, how, how did you just, I don't know, like deal with like just real life, like just like friends going out, like, I mean, yeah, well, I have in, I have Instagram and social media, so it was really it was definitely hard to see that because you know my life was definitely on pause. Like I was definitely very active in the city, would go out and meet with friends, have drink with, drinks with coworkers and clients, and was traveling every weekend to you know go up to Boston to see a game at BC or you know go visit a friend in another city. So I was definitely very busy and my very busy type A scheduled life had just gone from like having plans all the time to sitting in my house all day long. So um, I watch a lot of Netflix. Um, if you want to ask a show, I've probably watched <laughs> it. Um, but you know, it was, it was definitely really hard, especially at the time I, I, I was living in the city and one, it's amazing how many other people are just around during the day in the city. Like you think when you're at work, there's nothing else going on, but it is very active. Um, so fortunately I was able to kind of do stuff in the city and hang out in my apartment and see friends on the weekends and the weeknights and spent a lot of nights with Morgan um, hanging out. And we, uh, and my, my boyfriend's also in the city. So I, and at the time I lived in Tribeca and he was on the Upper East Side. And so, you know, I would spend time when I was having my treatments on the Upper East Side because it's right near the hospital. So um, I got to go and eat at a lot of cafes during the day and read a book. So I, I tried to give myself a schedule when I started to feel better. So like the first week after the treatment, I usually did not feel well. So I was pretty much laying low hanging out, laying in bed. And then once I started to feel better, I would, you know, the second week I would kind of reemerge into society and mm -hmm. do some activities. I started taking some pure bar classes um, because I really didn't have the lung capacity um, because one of the side effects of one of the drugs is uh, diminished lung capacity. So I couldn't really run and I love to run. Um, so that was, that was definitely really difficult because that was kind of always my outlet for you know stress relief so I found other ways to do that so I would go for long walks and you know try and try and stay as active as I could um, because fitness has always been a huge part of my life so I didn't want to give that up but also wasn't you know going to gyms because from for a germ factor um, because when you are going through chemotherapy um, your your white blood cell count can be diminished and then you could be at risk for, you know, getting other things. So basically when you're going through chemo, at least for Margarita, my um, experiences, you know, you want to make it through without anything else making you sick. The normal mm -hmm. side effects from the chemo you can deal with, but you don't want to get pneumonia or a cold or something because that could turn into something so much worse. So mm -hmm. fortunately for us, we were very lucky that yeah. we made it through our treatments without having- Again, we were wearing masks before they were cool, so. <laughs> um without having any of those things go mm -hmm. on so i mean definitely trying to stay <clears throat> excuse me um you know busy and keeping your mind going um was was really yeah was really uh, and important. i think that everybody handles their own like journey differently and through each of our hospitals and even like the insurance there are people that will reach out to you and say like i'm here like i'm a licensed therapist like do you want to talk to me type of thing and you'll get calls from random numbers and now you have to answer them type of thing so I think that I like then, a piece of advice is like, if you need help, ask for it. Yeah. And, and I did see a, um, a therapist at Sloan 
um, once a month when I was going through my treatment because I personally just thought it was really important for me to speak to somebody um, about what I was going through who had no opinion and I could kind of just say what I wanted and just talk about you know life and you know all of those things that you want to talk about but don't and or talk through with somebody or how do you get through this and um most like Marguerite said most hospitals have resources but um also your insurance company definitely does um because I spoke to a nurse once a month from United Healthcare who would call me to just check in and see how my treatment was going and if there was anything that you know, additional that I needed. So there are, there are a ton of resources out there and also support groups as well. Um, I was connected uh, to YSC, which is the Young Survivors Coalition and also Five Under 40, which is a uh, group of women. Um, they highlight um, women who are under 40 who have breast cancer. How do you guys deal with fear? Because it seems like you guys had a good handle on things but I mean I'm trying to put myself in your situation and I don't think I would be as put together it's definitely scary like you know hearing you have cancer it sucks like it's it's kind of like a gut punch but you know I think at least for me and I I I would think Marguerite as well we we always grew up being athletes so we kind of you know, obviously we were make sure that's written down somewhere that she called me an athlete. Like, <laughs> um, I've been holding my tongue. I was like, I'm sorry, Michaela, Marguerite. Are you talking about? Um, I yeah. am just in a different way, <laughs> but you know, obviously it's scary, but I think for us, we kind of just took it as, okay, here's all the information that we have. What can we do about it? And I think the biggest thing now is fortunately there's so much research and so many different treatments and you know, getting cancer now is not a death sentence, depending on what you get. Yeah. Like there was never the, I never had a fear that I was going to die. Although I made that joke earlier, I like never thought in my mind that like I, this was going to get me. I was like, there's, I'm going to, I thought, I thought I was going to die when I tore my ACL in college. That to me was like the world ending. This obviously was very scary, but there are, there are ways to treat it. And you know, if you, catch it early and you do your homework and you go to the doctor, mm-hmm. if something is wrong, go to the doctor. If you don't feel well or something's not yeah. right, you got to be you your gotta, own advocate. You got to be your own advocate and say, you know, this isn't right. Something's not right. I need to get a second opinion. And, yeah. you know, from there, you know, fortunately we had very good doctors mm-hmm. in our corners to help us. But I mean, yes, there were definitely days when I was scared and I had a lot of sleepless nights just thinking about everything and the world and life. And Mm -hmm. um, I would say there's more, and this is only speaking on behalf of myself, but there's more like a a post fear now, knowing that like, oh shoot, what is this random lump? Like it could be a freckle or like it could be something else that like you just don't know. So Mm -hmm. you'd rather be over cautious versus like being like oh it's nothing like I already went through the worst thing and unfortunately like our stories didn't even just start like at our own stories like I feel like our network of people like the word cancer comes up every other year just based off of like family friends or family type of thing so we had seen other people go through at least in my mind a lot worse situation than I went through when like I've taken other people's lives so like it more so put things into perspective. And I think that's like where like the We Fight Like Girls was birthed from, Um, knowing that the worst thing could have happened and it didn't. And we like live to tell the tale of that regard, but you always have to like keep your guard up just like health wise now. Is there anything else that the two of you, you know, especially for someone out there who's going through this in their twenties, and obviously you gave a lot of great advice, you know, in terms of support groups in terms of, you know, dealing it, dealing with it your way and, you know, who you told and things of that nature. But um, anything that you look back on and you're like, I should have done it this way earlier or something like something like that come to mind? I honestly think, I mean, this is a loaded question and I'm having five seconds to think about it, but I would say I did it like looking back and granted, I don't know anything different, but like, it's not like I have like regrets or something or like looking back, I wish I did like X, Y, Z. I think that I got 
the guidance and information that like I needed to help me and like my family who helped make the decisions, like make the right ones, which was fortunate. Um, and yeah. I think, you know, for me, I went in there with a lot of questions and, you know, I was, and then I thought I would feel bad. I'm so sorry. I have another question. You don't feel bad about asking questions The the doctors are there to spend time with you and answer your questions. If they're brushing you out the door, they're not the right fit for you. Yeah. Um, and you know, some people don't want to know all the answers. They just want to know, okay, this is what I'm going through. This is how we're going to treat it. Blah, blah, blah. But for me, I wanted to spend time. I wanted to get to know my doctor. I wanted for them to answer all of the questions that I had about, you know, every little thing. Oh, I'm having this side effect. Oh, I'm, this is not right. Or, you know, they're there to answer your question. Mm -hmm. So, um, Cause if, and if you are that type of person that needs to ask the questions, then you won't reflect back and be like, Oh, I wish I had done this differently because you know that you've made decisions that a hundred percent align with how you want the process to go or like what fits best with you. Yeah. And, and, you know, looking back on it, I am nothing but grateful for everybody mm -hmm. that helped throughout the process, whether it's our immediate family, our extended family, our friends, our community in Garden City, mm -hmm. our respective, you know, school friends from BC and Hopkins and Elon. And it's really incredible how much support you can feel from all of these different people who you may not spend all that all that much time with and I think you know at least for us and we're extremely grateful to the nurses and the doctors and the chemo nurses especially mm -hmm. because you spend a they're lot of time so with, they're so amazing and you spend so much time with them and they really do help you get through the process and they have tips and tricks from previous patients and you know it's really really nice to have those people surround you during that time. So it's, it is very difficult, but fortunately we were surrounded by a lot of love and support. So it, it made the process a lot, a lot better. Yeah. So, uh, you know, now I, I cut you off when you guys were talking about it, but do you want to go into, you know, you two have been through a lot and then when does the, the topic of, uh, forming, we fight like girls, yeah. So fruition. I think so when I was going through, Mikkel ran the New York City Marathon and what she ended up doing was um, raising money for the foundations for women's cancer through the race. She made shirts and everything and then got the company to match. Right. Or did I make that up? Morgan Stanley? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Morgan Stanley did a matching donation. So um, I feel like that was the start so of it. That was kind of the beginning. Um, and then the next year, Marguerite did a fundraiser through Pure yeah. Bar um, that, you know, we kind of titled fight like a girl because at the time, um, that was kind of my emails tagline. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. we, after that, you know, the idea was out there. We had hats made and bracelets. And when we were going through the process, it was a lot of processing back and forth with yeah. the company that we were working with and ended up going with, we fight like girls instead of fight like a girl. And yeah. you know, at the end of the day, it made a lot more sense because we collectively are fighting mm -hmm. together and we yeah. have both been through this fight. And so then once that fundraiser was over, we raised almost $6,000, which was incredible. And then this year, um, obviously because there was a global pandemic and we couldn't actually gather together in person, we decided to do a virtual run slash walk in our community. So, you know, ask that people if they were home, you know, in their own neighborhoods, wherever you are to, you know, run or walk on October 3rd and support breast and ovarian cancer research. So we donated money to Memorial Sloan Kettering Breast Cancer Research, which is actually specifically going to my doctor, Dr. Goldfarb, and they're creating a young woman's breast cancer institute at Sloan Kettering, which is really exciting. I'm really, it should be open and running in the next year. It'll provide additional resources for women who are um, under 40 years old who have breast cancer who are being treated at Sloan and then the other funds were donated to the foundation for women's cancer so um, we have a lot of information on our website www.wefightlikegirls.com um, and you can read more about it but um, this year we were able to raise um, $60,000 um, for our did causes. not have those expectations yeah we were, we were really just trying to um, you know, get to 10,000. And yes. once we hit 10,000 pretty quickly, we were 
really, really excited. And so we're in the process now of, um, you know, forming our 501c3 mm -hmm. and doing some really cool gear, uh, which we're all yeah. wearing, but yeah. you can't see it because <laughs> this is a podcast. <laughs> um, She's and, like, what are we going to wear? I was like, I don't think they can see us. Um, so, you know, we're, again, so fortunate to have incredible support from yeah. our, our communities and from, you know, Morgan Stanley and um, Odyssey mm -hmm. and Boston College Lacrosse and Hopkins Lacrosse. Yeah, and like near and far the support for this past fundraiser, I feel like, which is why it made such a success was that we had people like in California that were running or they would send out whatever link that we had. And then Morgan's whole Hopkins team like got involved in it, same with Mikhail's BC team. So it wasn't just like five people trying to raise this money. Like, I don't even know how many people at the end of the day really got involved, but they were like, hundreds of thank you cards that were sent out that just shows like the breadth of the support that we did end up having which like grew this like one time fundraiser at the local peer bar that I work work at um to so much of a bigger thing to where it is now that we could do this as like a um an annual yeah event. and I think the biggest thing is you know obviously our causes are breast and ovarian cancer that we specifically have supported, but, you know, we are here to support anybody who's going through a cancer and through this, through our storytelling and sharing and being open with this information, um, we've been able to connect with a lot of current cancer patients and kind of help them navigate through the process. So we really want people to know that we're here to be a resource and, and, you know, have a candid conversation because yes. I think when I was going through treatment, I spoke to a lot of incredible women who kind of helped guide me through my process and kind of gave me their stories so I could make an informed decision about what the best treatment was or the best process was for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that information is power. And for us, as we kind of go through this process of really defining what we want, we fight like girls to be, we want to have those conversations with people yeah. and, you know, let them know that we are here as a resource to, to kind of share our experience. Mm -hmm. Cause you don't, you don't know anything about the category until you're in the category. And then you're like, I am so smart on all these types of drugs <laughs> that I never needed to know about, but it's cool when you have not cool because obviously someone's like going through this again, but then you have doctors reach out to you and be like, can you talk to this person? Like I thought of your name immediately. And you're like, sure. I don't know what words of wisdom I'm going to give her, but like, let's do it type of thing. And then you create like a own network within a, within that kind of space. Too. Yeah. And we're, we're very uh, grateful for being on the yes. grateful for living podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, thank you. Um, because it, it definitely is, is an awesome opportunity to kind of share our, mm -hmm. our story. And, um, because like the title of your podcast is we are definitely grateful for living. So, yeah. um, you know, really, really means a lot to, to be here today. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, so much. And, you know, to turn, you know, a negative into a positive to the tune of $60,000 is, is quite the, We're quite the impressive for, open for more this year. So yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, we're, we're, we don't have a date nailed down yet um, for the fall, but September is ovarian cancer awareness month and October is breast cancer awareness month. So we will have an event in and around that time mm -hmm. and um, we'll probably have a, a pop-up gear store in the next couple of weeks. So with, mm -hmm. some, cool, with some cool swag. So we're we're really excited the about ball it. The is rolling again in 2021. Yes. So mm -hmm. hopefully this year we'll be actually able to, you know, meet up in person with mm -hmm. people and have a, an even bigger celebration. So we're, uh, we're really excited. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to uh, talk about? I don't, think uh, so. I don't know. I've ever I, talked about myself. I know. I feel like, you know, not that Morg didn't really get in there for very long, but I feel like we had a lot of information to, to really share. Yeah. We love I you. did what I could. I texted her. I was like, was I speaking for a while? She's like, yeah, a really long time. I was like, I was like yeah, you, you definitely talked like, longer oh, no, than Mikhail like, did. Stop it. No, no but it's, I mean, it's important because there's going to be another girl in their, their 20s that, yeah. you know, hopefully if they can hear this might help in their process, you know, definitely it's a little yeah. bit of a foundation for them. Yeah. And, you know, again, thank you for, for having us on today. We're, yeah, we're excited to have the opportunity to share our story and hopefully uh, make a difference. Yeah.
Um, for people that want to support, uh, we will fight or we fight like girls. You know, do you want to talk about how they can do that? Yes. Yeah, so you can check out our website, www.wefightlikegirls.com. Um, all of the information is on there. We, Marguerite, uh, her blog is on there so you can learn more about her story. Um, I have a couple articles posted as well as our bios and information. We also have an Instagram at we fight underscore like girls that you can check out. We have a ton of content on there um, about our event last fall and the Pure Bar event in 2019. And then that's kind of where we'll be posting a lot of our updates. And there is a beautiful shiny button that says donate now on the top right corner of the webpage. If you would like to make a donation to um, our cause, you can do so there. But um, that's that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, if nothing else, then uh, thank you guys so much. Seriously. Um, you know, I, as I said before, you know, just to, to go through what you guys went through and then to now turn that into a major positive of, you know, a support group that people uh, can turn to and, and uh, raise money for is, is incredible. Cause you know, you're turning, um you know a negative interaction for the positive and uh you know best of luck going forward and uh you know i'll definitely be advertising whenever i can on the the, ver the walks and things like that well, we appreciate it oh, thank you <laughs> thank you so much thank you talk to you